Why don't you stand to your feet, and uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and get started with our worship this morning, uh, getting ourselves kind of focused on praising Him because of all He is and what He does and all the things He's carrying us through. So if, uh, as we've been doing for the last little while, uh, if, if you have a need or you know of someone who has a need, would you just slip your hand up? And now, would you just take a moment and turn around and see all these hands, see all these needs? Just put a face with that need, okay? All right, you can put your hand down. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll lift these up and just let him take control of this service and have his way and do his work, okay? Father, thank you so much for your wonderful mercy and your grace and, Lord, your tenderness that you see each and every one of these needs that have raised a hand. We don't know the specifics of those needs, but we know that you do. And so we ask, Lord, that you'll intervene in the Holy Spirit, bring a touch of healing, bring a touch of encouragement uh, where it's needed, Lord. And we thank you that we're able to boldly come before you and leave these things at your feet and know that you uh, will meet these needs. And we praise you and we thank you so much for everything that you're doing, knowing that you're in control of all things and we can trust you. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 Why don't you sing along with us this morning? Go ahead.
just give you honor, all the honor and glory that you deserve. What an amazing God. God is so good, right? And all the time, we got this little um, hymn, Bill and Gloria Gaither put this together years ago. Uh, just thought we'd kind of close out our congregational worship with this. Go ahead. There is truly something about that name. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, 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 bless praise you and thank you that you are our Savior, Jesus. You are amazing, and we just give you all the glory and praise you deserve. Amen. Amen. Why don't you be seated? Amen. Amen. Well, there is something about that sweet, sweet name. I want to read to you Isaiah 12. And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away. And you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yahweh, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Aren't you grateful uh, that the King is our salvation, folks? If you're here today, I believe you're here by divine appointment. And I am so glad that you're here with us. If you have never filled out a guest card uh, in your bulletin, there's a little tear-out section. If you would just write your name and information there, that way we can just get a record that you're here and we can reach out to you and just say thank you for being with us here at Mount Pleasant. That would be absolutely fantastic. I want to just share with you a couple of announcements before we uh, get ready to receive our tithes uh, and our offering. Um, if you could, if you ever have a, an announcement in the coming days to make things a little simpler for Sherry in the church office, if you could just put that in her box, which is right outside of the office door area. That just makes sure that we don't miss anything that would come through for announcements and things of that nature, okay? Um, next Saturday, uh, ladies, my bride is absolutely ecstatic about uh, this uh, ladies and littles tea party. I think she's with one of our littles right now out in the back. So we got a lot of littles at our house, amen? And we're done, by the way. But uh, <laughs> just in case you didn't know going to be a sweet, sweet time next week. She's got some setup she's going to uh, take care of this week. I say all that to simply say this. If I could get a couple guys that would like to help out this afternoon arrange some tables. I don't know what that looks like because I'm not the one in charge of it, but my wife is handling that, but I'll be out there and she'll be pointing and clicking on where we need to set some tables up. That would be fantastic. If I have a couple guys, it shouldn't take me just a few minutes because uh, the later it gets, the hungrier we are. So uh, we'll be very, very quick 
handling um, that, uh, and that would be fantastic. Uh, with that in mind, since the tea party is next week, we sort of double book some things this week, and that kind of happens. So um, on Wednesday, we will not have our uh, first of the month um, October recharge meal because there's going to be doing some setup this week for this tea party, so that will be postponed. But we'll pick back up in November uh, and through the remainder of the year, and of course, starting in January. So we'll continue that, but just as a FYI. Uh, let me see what else I've got here. Brief deacons meeting real quick, guys, right after service. Uh, we'll be brief. We just have one matter to discuss. And I've got something I'll share at the end of service. But uh, the king is faithful, and I'm glad to be here. I can't wait to preach today. Uh, the Lord's loaded my wagon, and I hope, yours, I hope yours is empty so that you can take home what I'm about to give you today, okay? Uh, let's receive God's tithes and offerings. Ushers, if I could have you men just come forward today. And let's pray for our offering, and um, then we will uh, give as unto the Lord here today, okay? All right, let's pray. Gracious King of kings and Lord of lords, we thank you for this opportunity to give as unto you. Lord, I'm thankful that uh, relationships are continuously being built here at Mount Pleasant. Thank you, God, for all of the, the ladies that were a part of the uh, conference this past weekend and the joy that was there. Lord, I pray that the relationships that were continued to uh, flourish there will continue to flourish here. Father, we praise you that we are able to gather in your presence. Lord, these are unique days, but you're a faithful God, and that does not catch you by surprise, the affairs of this world. Lord, everything is on your clock, and I pray we'll be mindful of that. Lord, I pray that as our worship pastor and others continue to lead us, that we'll sing us to you. Uh, there is truly something sweet about that name. Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know, and for that I'm grateful. Lord, I pray we give to you and worship you in our giving today. In the lovely name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. You worship as we give here today. There are situations in our lives where we have, um, we don't really have any power or control, right? I mean, we just, well, it just seems like we don't have any power or control to fix it. I'm a fixer, so I like to put my hands on something and fix it. So I'll run right to it and try to grab a wrench or some super glue or duct tape or paper clip, and I'm hot after it, you know. Sometimes all we have left to do, and the thing we probably should have started with, is simply speak Jesus. <laughs> All right? Hope you worship with us in the song. Speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Now 
just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in 
will take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of John this morning. I want you to turn to the book of John if you would. And as you're turning there, I just want to read a card to us here today um, on behalf of a recent service we had here. Uh, thank you. It was so thoughtful of you and appreciated more than words can say. Thank you for your prayers, your thoughts, your love and understanding, your food and cards during my wife's home going. In Christ's love, the Lowell and Marie Belt family. So continue to just lift up Brother Lowell and his family in this season, um, if you would. And also, you know, building relationships. That's what it's about. We've got David back here in the back and his uh, I want to thank you for being here, sir. Thank you for those that were able to reach out and do some work around David's house yesterday. Uh, that was a very needful and helpful thing, and he's very appreciative of that. He asked me to share that on, on his behalf here today. So uh, building relationships is where it's at. Uh, you got to do that. Jesus was about building relationships with people. And I'm a firm believer that in any relationship, truth has to be the foundation of the relationship. That is, you speak truth to one another. I've learned that in my life, I still love to hear the simple gospel over and over. I mean, that's just kind of where I'm at, Allison. I just want to be told how to get saved again because uh, I, I need to be saved every day. I don't know about you. I, I, the same gospel that saved me is the same gospel I need to run to each and every day. And here we're going to find the words of Jesus as he speaks in a very unique situation, the mission of Mount Pleasant, build relationships, change lives. I want to talk about what that looks like with Jesus at a unique place in his life and ministry. Today's message is simply titled, Thirsty for Truth. I was at McDonald's not long ago. I go to McDonald's quite often. Oh, awesome, you found it. That's great. Um, I was at McDonald's not long ago, and um, people can make things on the spot. Isn't that great? Man, thank you all for doing that back there, um, because Slacker up here was not able to get things together like he needed to for this week. I, I just, this was a message that was all consuming, and I loved it. And I just wasn't able to get things fleshed out in a technical way like I like to. So thank you all for doing that. That's great. But uh, I was at McDonald's a few weeks ago, and I took a picture of it. I put it on Facebook. Some of you may have saw it, but it was a picture of the um, dispensers where you could get your beverage. And there's the tea section, the unsweet tea section. And it said thirsty. And it had Sprite, whatever else it had on there. And then it had right there in small writing, uh, white background, black letters, water. So amidst everything that was just blaring, you could get water. But it, it's, it's not very visible. And we all know that the only thing that can quench the, the legitimate thirst of the body is, is water. But you couldn't really see it because of everything that was surrounding it. And I'm a firm believer that in this world, there are so many things surrounding the genuine beverage, if you will, of living water. That it's very difficult, Charles, for people to see what can truly quench their thirst. So I want to talk about that here today. And we'll talk about why this pink tint is here today. All of it will make complete sense in 30 minutes. So I want you to give me your attention for 30 minutes. You don't have anything better to do than sitting where you're at. So why not give me 30 minutes of your time? And I want it to be undivided so that we can hear what the king has to say to us today. You ready? All right, here we go. I want you to stand with me as we read John chapter 7. This is going to be the best 30 minutes of everybody's week, I promise you. <laughs> Verse 37, John 7, 37. On that day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Lamb of God, I pray that you give the one that speaks liberty. I pray you bring to his mind what needs to be declared, strike from his memory, what would take away from your glory. May you and you alone be magnified here today, Lord. I pray, God, for those little ones in the nursery to every person here this morning, from the youngest to the eldest. God, I pray that we would speak the name of Jesus. God, what a lovely song. 
thank you for that. And I pray that Jesus would be spoken over our lives by the Holy Spirit. In his lovely name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. You can be seated for me. John chapter 7, that very familiar passage where Jesus stands up and says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. And out of his, I love the King James, out of his bowels, out of his gut, flow rivers of living water. Well, why would Jesus make such a statement? And why does the Bible say first on the last day and then secondly on that great day? What's the significance there? Well, Jesus was Jewish. I am not. I am redneck. So I need to get into the mindset of a Jewish culture and figure out what's going on here at this point. Well, context is, so in John 7, where you have what the, the, the beginnings of this feast, you'll find Jesus interacting with his brothers. Jesus had unique family dynamics. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, has some kind of family situation that is less than ideal. In some way, shape, or form. Jesus had some less than ideal family situations. He had some discrepancies with his brothers and sisters and vice versa. As a matter of fact, if you just look back up in verse number 3 of John chapter 7, the Bible says, His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. Now, you see it on the paper. It's sometimes hard to get into the mind of these folks as they're saying this. But that was not a complimentary thing to say. They were saying, leave. Go do these works elsewhere. Let someone see you openly. And could could I just say this? That could be very hurtful. If you have something that's very precious to you, very personal, and someone just makes a jab, especially someone you love, it kind of stings. And Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. And that would mean that things would sting, that it would hurt him, that he would feel that. Well, Jesus goes on to live by his mission. He doesn't go up to this feast just yet. The Bible says that he waits a little bit. And then the word goes on to tell us that at the feast, this particular feast, which we'll unpack here in a minute, that at this feast, so many are saying, have you seen him? Where is he at? Wonder what he's going to do this time. Uh, Has anybody heard where Jesus is? And even the religious elite are wondering, where's he at? Where's he gone? Can I just get out here on a limb here because that's where some fruit's at? I don't care what you think about Donald Trump or whatnot, but around election time and afterwards, he's disappeared. Because I personally believe that satanic forces wanted to put away truth. That's just what it is because the people that are in charge are not people they're satanic people being led by satan you can take that to the bank and cash it you don't got to wait till monday for that check to clear so the reality is he just disappeared no one could find him he was banned in facebook jail you know just all of this stuff just totally gone absolutely gone jesus doing miracles left and right all of a sudden hey anybody seen jesus crickets gone Where's he at? Well, I heard him. I heard this. I heard he's gone. Where's he at? And all of a sudden, the Bible says, Jimmy, that he goes up to the feast. He goes secretly. He comes up. And he's observing. He's waiting. And he's watching. You say, okay, preacher, what's the feast about? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's the next thing I want to get to. The feast is what takes place in Leviticus chapter 23. You say, oh boy, here we go. Leviticus 23, one page 101. The Bible says it like this. Leviticus chapter 23. Listen to these words in verse 39. And on the 15th day of the seventh month, When you have gathered the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. So it's a week Sabbath, eight days a week, you heard the song. This is an eight-day feast. There's no such thing as an eighth day. There's only seven days in a week, isn't there? Then the Bible says in verse 42, you shall dwell in booths, tents, for seven days. All who were native Israelites shall dwell in in booths or tents or tabernacles. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. You shall 
uh, have the children of Israel dwell in the booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You see, Brother Donnie, what, the, what, what God told Moses there was, here's what will take place once every year. You will have these Israelites do something to remind themselves of their coming out of the land of Egypt. And you will remind yourself of what it was to leave Egypt and then to go into the promised land. But this is a festival. It's a feast that will remind you of the transition stage. And in that transition stage, the Israelites lived in tents. Now, you could imagine in your sanctified imagination, when they first left Egypt, they had nothing except the food that they had prepared for Passover, the shoes on their feet, clothes on their back, and the riches of Egypt that the, uh, that the, pharaohs, that the Pharaoh and his people said, just take it and leave. So they had the booty. They had goods to live off of. Well, as they went along the Nile River, more than likely, where there were reeds um, and different things, different branches, they would use that for their tents. But as time progressed, you find out that they were able to make the tabernacle and they were able to dwell in a rich, for all intents and purposes, setting because they had different dyes to make these this tabernacle. Um, a pastor friend that I know of has a real tabernacle that's like the size of this um, church building, and he... He has set it up before and actually done a walk through tabernacles. Really cool. But these Israelites were able to set this up. So their ability to dwell in tents matured over time. But God gave some statutes here. And the statute was simply this. That when you observe the feast of booths, the feast of tents, the feast of tabernacles, whatever you want to call it. When you observe this feast, you are to dwell in a particular type of tent. It was to have three sides. You can see Eliana's tent up here. Okay, just use your sanctified imagination. It's amazing how God works. I've had this message on my mind all day. And I come home this past week, and Eliana has her blessed tent <laughs> set up. And I thought, oh, Holy Ghost, you have loaded, you are, you, you are all over this. So we have been in this tent all weekend, and it's been amazing. You know what was so cool? Boy, this is amazing how the king works. I, I woke up on s Tuesday morning early. Right, right before the kids got up, you know, rub the sleep out your eyes, kind of remind yourself, okay, I'm saved. And then you uh, say, Jesus is Lord, kind of get some water in the fuel tank, turn on the lamp, kind of squint. Lord, where are we going Sunday? I, I know we're building relationships, changing lives. God, take me there. We got to go there. And we're there in John 7. And I started looking up when the actual Feast of Tabernacles was for this year. And it was, ah, oh, I wish you could see the chill. But it was, it, listen, it was September of last Monday through September of this past Monday. So Monday, September 27th, I found out on 6 o'clock a.m. Tuesday morning, this is what the Lord wanted me to preach, the day after the Feast of Tabernacles. God help you. Is that not amazing? I didn't know that. But I've had the, I've had the feast on my mind here for a while. And September is the new month for the Jewish calendar. So we, we went there. And then Eliana puts up this tent, or Christy puts it up. She probably could assemble it. She can do about anything, really. She gets that from me. But, you know, <laughs> the thing is, um, she, she, she built this tent. Christy built this tent for Eliana. And then I came home and I sat in it and I thought, this is amazing. The tent of the Israelites should have, be, should have three sides. One on either side, a back side, and it had, it had to have room enough, Vicky, room enough in there for a little table for you to have a meal. It had to be big enough for at least one person to s sleep in there, and it could be big enough for a family. The second aspect about this tent is the tent of the Israelites had to be made specifically out of leafy greens of whatever, um, more than likely palm branches. But one of the other particulars, Gina, was that the, the palm branches could not cover one another. They had to leave enough space so that they could look up and still see the stars. The, the purpose for that was to remind the Israelites that the faithfulness of their creator, God, existed for 40 solid years. And it was a haunting reminder that, that when they got in that tent... That they could look up and see this life is bigger than me and these stars are shining over me. And even in Jesus' day, Israelites would build their tents and they would go out and sleep there. And this is where my mind goes. Jesus went up to the feast and he dwelled in one of those tents. The very one who John 1 says in the beginning, Logos. In the beginning was the Word, Logos. And the Word 
was with God and the word was God. He tabernacled is the Greek word. He dwelt among us. So the one that tabernacled among us took up residence in a tabernacle at a feast that was all about the king anyway. Aren't you grateful that Jesus so condescended himself, and I say that word respectfully, he so condescended himself so that he understands the dynamics and the situational circumstances surrounding your life. He understands all of that. When it comes to building relationships with people, you don't go up to them and say, well, here's what you need to do. Boy, I can't stand it when someone comes and tells me this is what you need to do. Friend, everybody knows what to do with a bucking horse except the fellow that owns one, right? You know, everybody telling me how to run my life, but I feel like my life's so run in me. You ever heard that statement? Listen, when it comes to advice, Jesus was here to say, I am with you. I feel you. I experience what you're going through. I understand you. I grapple with it. Jesus dwelt in those tents for seven days. The first day, as Leviticus says, it was a high holy day. Well, the Bible also says that it became a holy day on the eighth day. Now, that's very unique. Why in the world would it be the eighth day? Well, I want you to look at what the Bible says in verse 37. On the last day, that great day. The great day was known as the day of rejoicing of the house of the drawing of water. That's a unique day. Why is that day significant? Well, that day is significant because, hear me, hold it with me. Have you ever heard of Hezekiah, the king? You ever heard of him? Okay. My wife has been to this location in Israel, and it's really amazing. In the days of Hezekiah, the king, he knew that uh, outside armies would wage war on Israel. Just bear with me. Please listen to this. People would wage war on Israel. Well, here's what he did. He commanded that there would be a tunnel dug from the outside spring of I- near, Jerusalem, near, near Israel and go inside the city gate of Jerusalem, and it would be through limestone. So two groups of soldiers or men would work on either side, and they chiseled underground this tunnel. It's called Hezekiah's Tunnel to this day, and it still works. My wife has gone through this tunnel. It's about a mile and a half long. Now, a group of guys started on one side. A group of guys started on the other side. They chiseled through rock. You can still see the chisel marks today. Well, in 1880, this is cool. I'm, I'm a nut when it comes to history. In 1880, it was found an inscription in this tunnel of a celebration of when these two groups met. That is that one group dug on the side where the pool, the spring, originated. And they started digging one way. The other group started digging the other way. And they chiseled based on what was easiest to chisel. You ever been? You ever chiseled with rock? You chisel what's going to be the easiest. Well, as they chiseled, they began to hear one another on either side. You can't make this stuff up. And then where they met, there was an inscription on the wall. And it was found in 1880. And God did something miraculous. Well, that pool, that spring would feed all the way down to another pool. At what pool? You say, preacher, I don't know what that pool is. Yes, you do. In John 5, the King James says, wilt thou be made whole? And what did Jesus have a guy do? He said, pick up your bed and walk. That was the pool of Bethsaida. That's where the Hezekiah's tunnel ends up. At this pool. But it starts with a spring. You say, why would you say all that? Well, I said that to say this. I'm saying a lot. On the eighth day, a priest would take a bucket and dip water from the spring. And he would march with a huge processional behind him. One time around the temple for six days. And on the seventh day, which would have been their last day, they would march around the temple seven times. And after the seventh round, in a symbolic, joyous way, they would pour out this water. This is the only feast of Israel where the Israelites were commanded to be joyful. Every other feast was called a solemn feast. But this was a joyous 
face. Isaiah 12 and verse 3. I read it just early. I think I read it. If I didn't, I should have read it. Uh, Isaiah 12 and verse 3 says, Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Salvation in Hebrew is simply Yeshua. I speak Jesus. Jesus is Yeshua. I speak Yeshua. That is, I will draw water from Yeshua. I will draw water from the well, the person of salvation. So Jesus, listen to me, Jesus waited till the last day of the great feast. The processional was going on. And Jesus wanted to wait till everybody had the intensity rising. The tensions were rising. It was a celebratory manner. Let me park it here for a minute. It's kind of like Christmas for us. When I was a kid, after Santa Claus rode into town in, uh, at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, it was now Christmas time. But now, some of these folks, and you may be some of them, that when October 29th hits, you got a tree up. And it's kind of an anticlimactic thing. If you do that, you know, you know what I'm talking about? You wait till Thanksgiving. Then after that Thanksgiving meal, it was the day after Thanksgiving. What you do? You pull out your tree and you start putting it up. And there's the expectation of Christmas is now coming. Christmas is now coming. Friend, this is what's going on. That's the type of heightened anticipation that's going on. And none of these folks were putting out Christmas trees on Halloween. They were waiting and waiting and waiting. You're going to put your tree up on out. You're not going to put a picture on the computer. Because, oh, man, he's going to see it. And he's going to come down on me. <laughs> I, I'm not a Facebook troller. I'm not one of these guys that does that. Listen, Jesus was waiting. Jessica, he was waiting on heightened anticipation. And on that last lap. They probably running three wide. Some of you race guys know what I'm talking about. Listen, checkered flags down. Listen, they're running three wide. They're on the last lap. And all of a sudden, Jesus speaks up. And he says, if any man thirsts, they knew what he meant. No one in his right mind would speak up like this. Because something of a solemn manner was taking place. But in verse 37, the Bible says, if anyone thirst, he didn't stand up and say it, if you're thirsty. He said it with boldness. He said it with unction. He spoke from his diaphragm. He took a big win and he said, if any man thirst, let him come to me. And the rendering is let him keep coming to me. Let him keep drinking. Let him become one with me. If any man's thirsty, let him come to me. Because as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. They knew what he meant. Because the water that was poured out at the temple came from an unknown source. That it, it came from a spring at the pool of Siloam. It came from a spring, friend. And Isaiah says that therefore with joy you'll draw water from the wells of salvation. At the Feast of Booths, that was the only feast where you were commanded to be joyful. Nehemiah 8 and verse 10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Therefore, with joy, you'll draw water from the wells of salvation, from the spring of salvation. Jesus is saying, I am the spring. Isn't it amazing that those Israelites would march around the temple one time for every six days? But on the last day, they'd march around seven times. Some of you just got it, but let's go there for those that didn't. You go over to the book of Joshua, and you'll find out what happens at Joshua 6, verses 3 and 4. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you'll do six days. And seven priests shall bear trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Friend, a priest would lead the processional at the Feast of Booths. But the seventh day, you'll march around the city seven times, and the priest will blow the trumpets. Listen, after that seventh lap, they would pour the water out in a symbolic expression of faith. Friend, here they don't see walls falling, but they see water pouring. And for some of us in this room, we need to sense the presence of the Lord pouring out 
in our lives. Some of us don't need walls to fall anymore. You're already saved. You're right with the Lord. But there needs to be water pouring. What is that for? Well, I'm glad you asked. That means that you need a daily dose of Jesus each and every day. Morning, noon, and night. You need an abiding, continuous relationship with holy God. Not a little dabble, do you? Not Sunday morning, but a continual intimate relationship with this king of glory. You need water poured out in your life. Friend, Jesus said, I am living water. Then the Bible goes on to say, verse 39, but this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, the the, the, the living water could not flow out of you until Jesus ascended. But Jesus would ascend, and at his ascension, friend, it would be in such a way that the Holy Spirit would come and dwell you so that he flows from you. So how do you know you believe in him? The Spirit flows out of you. He flows out of you. Friend, does the Spirit flow out of your life? That is, when you encounter situations, what comes out? When you're squeezed, what comes out? What comes out? You ever dipped a washcloth in a sink full of water, and you pull it out and you squeeze that washcloth? What comes out of the washcloth? It's not a trick question. Water. It's like we took water, a hose, and we just sprayed the bathroom floor when our kids get out of the tub. <laughs> Lee is in this little thing right now, it's that washcloth. <laughs> I'm the only human being I know that breaks a sweat when I give my kids baths. <laughs> Chrissy's in there helping with supper. We're try you know, it's a tag team at our house. I have flat broke a sweat. But worse is when I preach. Just broke a sweat. But when you squeeze that washcloth, water comes out. Friend, I want to ask you, when the world squeezes you, what comes out of you? And friend, mark her down. What comes out of you is what's in you. It's that simple. You say, does Jesus always come out of you? No, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes in my life, Abby Jason will come out. But I do make it my rule of thumb, Miss Lenore, that Jesus comes out more than Jason. So how do you get Jesus to come out? I spend time with him, and you too. If anyone, what did he say? If anyone comes to me and keeps coming is the literal translation. you got to come and keep coming and keep coming to him. And out of you will flow rivers of living water, a river. You ever been at a river? You ever been around a river? Have you ever been around a raging river? Uh, some of you may have been to the to Nanahala River in Boone or the New River Gorge in West Virginia. We've been there. I've been there. Whitewater rafting. And you see what a river can do. And you, that's why it's called white water. It's white water because the rapids are like they are. You're, never, you're told to never stand up if you fall out of a raft. I don't tend to fall out of a raft. But if you ever do, you not to stand up because your foot can get caught in a rock. You're to just go with the flow. Bingo, friend. When it comes to walking with Jesus, he just flows out of you. The Bible says it like this, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Listen, it's from the Message Bible. I'm not saying that you ought to make that your main study Bible, but I tell you what, it's sure been a blessing to me because it's a paraphrase, all right? But here's what Eugene Peterson says. He says that you walk in the rhythms of his grace. Rhythms. Some folk ain't got rhythm, pardon my English. They just, they just... They just can't do it. There was a guy at Bless God of Calvary Baptist Church in Rock Hill. He wanted to worship the best he could. But Robbie helped my soul. He couldn't clap to save his life. <laughs> he couldn't clap for anything. Friend, you just don't think about it. You just, you just go with it. Friend, when it comes to walking with Jesus, you just go with it. You, you're so intimately united with him. Sarah, you're so acquainted with Christ that he lives through you, you walk with him, and there's a beauty to that. He flows through you. And you don't try to stand up and resist the water because you'll get drowned in it. Don't resist him. Can I be honest with you? Some of us in this room sometimes resist the Spirit. 
The Bible says, why do you do despite the spirit of grace? Galatians 2 and verse 20, I love it. It says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live of the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's wonderful. But verse 21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. Morris said, I believe that some of us will often frustrate grace. We try to get in his way. We try to stand up to him rather than go and live in his flow. Friend, just cooperate with him. Act on his promptings. If you knew how you knew, you wouldn't know that you know. You've heard me say that before. But if you know that you know and don't know how you know, it's a good sign that you do know. The late Bill Stafford taught me that, friend. You just walk with him. You're just in his flow. And you don't know how you're in the flow. You're just in the flow and you just know that you're walking with him. Well, how how does that work? Spend time with him. Take a washcloth and dump it in water and watch that washcloth start swimming and trying to go deeper. Does it try to do that? You ever seen a washcloth swim? No. Washcloths just... Sink. Friend, just quit. Just stop it. Spend time with him. And all of a sudden, you get soaked with him. And here's what will happen. A situation will rise up. And after you respond in it, you'll say to yourself, well, that had to be Jesus because that's certainly not the way I would have responded. <gasps> Guess what? Good. God doesn't want you. He doesn't need you. But the way you know that you're filled with him is he puts you in situations that get under your crawl. Ever had something get under your crawl? He puts something in your life that gets under your skin and swims beneath your skin. And the way you respond, you're surprised. and You realize, wow, that didn't smell like Jason. That smelled like Jesus. Guess what? You're spending time with him. And then the next day that same situation happens and you just fly off the handle. You flip the lid. You can say, oh, that smells a little bit more like Jason than it did Jesus. So what was wrong? Probably didn't spend as much time with him like you ought to. You see, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You can spend the time you want to with him today, but guess what? When tomorrow morning at 7.38 happens, you got to choose again to say Jesus is Lord. You say, well, that's difficult. Of course it is. If it was, if it was easy, man, everybody on the planet would be doing it. It's like exercise. If it was easy, everybody would do it. We'd all be trainers for a living. I'm not a trainer. I'm an eater. I'm a lover, not a fighter. No, I'm I'm an eater, not a trainer. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. My wife's got so many goodies at the house. We have done um, um, pies, but we've done um, chocolate-covered cherries. Boy, boy, good. God bless the chocolate-covered cherries. But it's made in a saved man's house, so it's sanctified, okay? <laughs> so if you eat it, you'll get holy next week. <laughs> but guess what? What I eat affects my life. The next day, what I eat affects my life. What you put in is going to affect you. It's that simple, friend. You say, well, that sounds like work. Bingo. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, on and on. Guess what the last element of the fruit of the Spirit is? Self-discipline. An undisciplined man or woman is a man or woman that isn't walking in the Spirit. And that hurts. That hurts because it's so easy to go overboard on things. Self-discipline. So when you walk with Jesus, you spend time with him. He comes out. And there's a work to it. There's a discipline to it. There's an activity. There, there, There is a cooperation with Christ. And some of us need to cooperate with the king of glory. And Jesus says that out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. i got two things I want to say. All right. If you're listening, say amen. All right. Jesus waited instead of worried what others thought of him. He waited instead of worried what other people thought of him. Anybody ever wonder what other people have thought of you? You know, it's like if you see a holy, you, you see a huddle of football players out on the football field and you lean over and you tell your wife they're talking about me. You know, you're so focused on what other people are talking about that you're wondering, are they talking about me? What's someone thinking about me? Jesus did not give his attention to what others thought of him. He gave attention to his mission that God the Father designed him for. Let me ask you this question. Am I more concerned of the opinion? I'm sorry. Am I more concerned of others' opinion of me 
than I am convicted of my own mission in life. You see, Jesus could have listened to the opinions of his brothers and sisters, but he focused on his mission, and he waited. And on the last day of the feast, regardless of where his brothers and sisters were, he spoke up and said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me. Because I have an idea he said that right as that water was being poured out by the priest so that everybody could know exactly what Jesus meant. Am I more focused on my uh, opinion of others or am I focused and convicted on my mission in life? Jesus waited instead of worried what others thought of him. Quit worrying what other people think about you. Can I burst your bubble here for a minute? People don't think about you as much as you think they do. (laughs) They don't. They don't. I mean, I mean, listen, there was a time in my life where folks thought I had hung the moon and it didn't take long but for me to be with them that they wished I was on the moon. <laughs> and I found out that people don't think about you as much as, they, as you think they do. People don't think about me as much as I think they Boy, man, that's a freeing day, Kevin. I can be me in Jesus. Jesus didn't worry about what other people thought of him. He waited. Secondly, he waited instead of wasted time convincing the naysayers. He waited instead of wasting time convincing the naysayers. Now, he didn't say, now, brother number one, you know that I'm the Messiah. He didn't say, brother number two, you know that I'm the Messiah. He didn't say, James, because that was his brother in the church. James, you know. You've seen me. I mean, use your imagination. You saw us out there working in the stone masons. You saw me hit my finger. You saw what brother number three said, but you saw that I didn't say it. You know, he didn't spend time convincing the naysayers. Some of us in this room, listen, hear me and hear me well. We're spending more time trying to convince other people than we are waiting and resting in the Lord. Am I, invest, am I wasting time investing my efforts into situations that don't matter rather than waiting to invest my life in something that does matter? Have you ever invested your life into something and you realize this is not of the Lord? Certain situations, hear me, friend, certain situations in life don't matter. You, you gotta know what to you gotta know when to fight for the king and when to just let it ride out. Some things will solve themselves. Jesus waited instead of wasting time trying to convince the naysayers. Listen, everybody is a prospect for the gospel, but everybody's not my prospect for the gospel. That's why I've got to be focused on my mission, what God's called me and directed me to. Jesus didn't waste his time. He focused on his mission, friend. Listen to me. Hear me and hear me well. Distraction is an enemy of your God-given destiny. Now, I'm not talking about a holy roller, name it, claim it, destiny. Like, bless God, I'm going to have a destiny. No, that's not what I'm talking about, friend. I'm talking about a spirit-filled, spirit-led destiny whereby you know the ambition and goal of your life is Romans chapter 8 that says that we are to be conformed And to the image of his son. The Holy Spirit will conform me to the image of his son. And I cooperate with the Spirit's promptings within me. Jesus said, he who believes in me out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And this he spake of the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit lives through me. But some of us can be so easily distracted with things around us. The goings-ons of the country, the recent update, the latest update, what have you. And sometimes we just need to simply rest. Chill out, Jason chapter 1 verse 1 says. (laughs) Chill out. Take a breather. Do what Lincoln's doing. Just lay there. Just lay in your father's arms. Just rest. Get in his tabernacle. This little story and I close. Leah and me got in her tent last night. She wanted to eat, drink her chocolate milk. And she likes it really chocolatey. She wanted her chocolate milk in her tent. Then she brought the Hungry Howie's pizza box into the den. You say, well, I don't eat on my carpet. Well, this ain't your house. (laughs) <laughs> but I'll tell you this your carpet probably a lot better than mine but we put that little box on the carpet and we got in the tent and started eating pizza and I started thinking about this 
And Leah's tent, you can't see it, but there's mesh up above it. So when I looked up what I said, I didn't see stars. I saw, you know, I saw the ceiling fan. Got a little claustrophobic, you know, sitting in there. But I thought, wow, we're sharing a meal. Just like the Israelites were supposed to do. Leah didn't plan that. But sometimes Jesus, the whole, through the Holy Spirit, will speak to you through a little one. And we had a meal in the tabernacle. And there was something sweet about it. A meal there. It connected her and I in a deep way. This morning, getting ready for church, she wanted to go to the tent. I said, honey, we're getting ready for church. She said, it's just pretend. It's pink church. So what did I do? In my dress clothes, white shirt, Charles, I got in. I went to pink church. And I sat with her in pink church in the tabernacle, friend. You know what some of us need to do? We need to drop what we're doing and tabernacle with the king. Sit down in his presence and drink chocolate milk and eat pizza. You need to sit down in his presence, drink his word, eat from his table. Jesus said, if you don't drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no part of me. They knew what he meant. What he meant was you got to dine on me. My blood has to cover you. My flesh becomes your flesh so that you don't walk in the flesh and fulfill the lust of the flesh, but you walk in the spirit. And let the Spirit live his life through you. Feast of Tabernacles. If anybody's thirsty, just come to him. That's it. And when you come and start drinking, you want more. So I want to ask you today, how much of Jesus have you drunk lately? Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Holy Father. We thank you that you tell us in your word in Isaiah 12 and verse 3. As we've quoted so often this morning, therefore with joy we will draw water from the wells of salvation. I want to pray for my brothers and sisters here today that need to drink from that salvation well and be refreshed spiritually. Father, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters that need to find a good place to tabernacle with you, spend time with the king, and listen to you so that they walk in your rhythms. Lord, I want to pray for someone in this room that maybe they have never drank from living water. They've never been saved. They've heard the gospel, but they've never said yes to it. I pray right now under the sound of my voice that the good news truths of your death, burial, and resurrection, Lord Jesus, on the behalf of all of us as sinners, was done once and for all at a cross. And that if we're willing by faith to say yes to you and no to sin, we can be saved from a place called hell and assured of a place called heaven and begin a relationship with you as saved individuals. God, if that's someone right now, I pray now, even now, they cry out and say yes to Christ. Turn from sin and self. And not try to live a perfect life, Lord, but let them live a surrendered life to you. May they repent. May they run to Jesus and be changed. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In the lovely name, we speak his name, Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen and amen. Whatever you need to do, you do quickly uh, as we sing this wonderful, sweet song here today. God bless you as you respond today. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God.
change my heart, oh God, make it ever true, change my heart, oh For just a minute, if you would, real quick. We'll be real quick here. I uh, just want to let you folks know um, we do a lot of ministry around here, and ministry takes finances, amen? amen. With that being said, uh, our deacons have uh, been approached, and there's been an approval to add a line item into, uh, the bu- to, into the budget for packs of love for up to $2,000. This is apart from the designated non-budget, and that simply means... Non-budget, meaning folks are able to contribute to that by donations whenever they would want to. So um, the deacons have approved that. We're going to mention this next week for just a simple vote to add that simple line item uh, to the budget to help with the cost. Everything's more expensive these days. I'm sure you know that. So this will help just offset some of uh, the folks that are really taking some uh, sacrifices to make that Packs of Love ministry uh, happen. So we'll vote on that just by simple vote next week, no discussion of any sort. So if you have any questions, just contact your deacon this week uh, for any further um, clarification, you know, if need be with that regard. I think Pax of Love is a really unique ministry where we give to kids that really need an extra meal as they come home uh, for the weekend. So uh, thank you for your uh, listening ear for that, but we'll take care of that um, for next week. Uh, I just want to say you're a fun group to preach to. Uh, I hate it's quitting time because I had a lot more left. And uh, we have a sweet, I don't take this for granted, church. The Holy Spirit has chosen to settle on us. And I don't take for granted, Ted, that he settled this week. He settled last week. That doesn't mean he has to settle next week. We've got to be in the flow, waiting on him, resting in him, seeking him. And you have a pastor that his heart's desire is to stay in the book so that he can have a fresh, hot bread for, for the people of God. And I, I can say that with confidence. And I asked it on Wednesday night, and I ask it today. I want you to pray for the one that stands behind this desk, that he might be able to preach and lead and shepherd, because these are very unique days of shepherding. I'll just say that and kind of leave it at that. I know our worship pastor can say the same thing. These are some unique days in which you minister. Um, but we are in a, a precious place of what God's choosing uh, to do so, let's keep focused on building relationships with other people throughout the the week, um, and just changing lives. So, look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. Again, if I could get a couple guys that would be willing to maybe stay for just a few minutes after service, uh, my lovely bride is going to kind of give some direction of where we need to have some tables set up for next Saturday's uh, event for our ladies' ministry. Um, that would be fantastic, guys. Deacons, just a quick meeting right after service. Uh, in, our, in our back uh, room, that would be fantastic. Got a little something to discuss. Um, but you're loved in Jesus. You're prayed for often. Um, Brother Don, I want to ask you to pray for us. And I want to just call you out and say thank you in your class for taking the bull by the horn to minister to someone in need. Um, that's the secret of ministry. You, you find out where God's working and you join him. Uh, we don't have to create ministry. We just say yes to what falls in the lap. Amen. So I thank God for that. So, Don, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Would you stand with us?